introduction. And as chair of the Economic Club of New York, um, I often have the honor of introducing the speakers to our forum. So it's really a special privilege today for me to speak. With I'm also pleased to be here during my favorite month of the year. The weather's warmer, baseball season is well underway, and the games are a lot shorter, thankfully. And it's the month when people around the world celebrate Star Wars, one of the all-time great franchises. Now, I'm often asked, you may be surprised to hear this, but I'm often asked whether I'm a fan of Star Trek or Star Wars. And my definitive answer is yes. So now I promise I won't spend my time talking about the weather or baseball. What I want to talk about today is inflation. Inflation remains too high. Infl high inflation is hardest on those who can least afford to pay high prices for food, shelter, and transportation. And we at the Federal Reserve are committed to bringing inflation down. As the Mandalorian would say, price stability, this is the way. Before I continue, I need to give the Fed standard Fed disclaimer that the views I express today are mine alone, do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Open Market Committee or others in the Federal Reserve system. So the FOMC is mandated by Congress to promote maximum employment and price stability. The goals of our, man, of our dual mandate are intrinsically linked. Specifically, price stability is essential for the economy to reach its full potential and to sustain maximum employment over the, longer, over the long term. Since the pandemic, imbalances between demand and supply have persisted throughout the economy, leading to high inflation and a tight labor market. Although we've seen some signs of a gradual cooling in the demand for labor, as well as for some goods and commodities, overall demand continues to exceed supply. Now, first, let's discuss what this means for employment. At the national level, job growth has been robust, with monthly job gains averaging about 220,000 over the past three months. And other indicators show that labor demand is gradually slowing, yet remains very strong. For example, job openings have come down from their peak back in March of last year. Still, the ratio of job openings to unemployed far exceeds the levels prevailing before the pandemic when the labor market at that time was also very strong. Similarly, quit rates have been gradually declining, but are above pre-pandemic levels. In addition, the unemployment rate is a historically low level of 3.4%. And in April, the employment to population ratio for those between the ages of 25 and 54 reached the highest level since 2001. So the strength of the labor market is evident in parts of the Federal Reserve Second District as well. In Fairfield County in Connecticut, it's fully recovered from the pandemic. Northern New Jersey is above where it was back in 2019. And New York City has also shown remarkable progress with employment closing in on pre-COVID levels. Nationally, we're also seeing improvements on the supply side of the labor market. As you'll recall, when businesses reopened after the 2020 pandemic shutdown, many face a dire shortage of workers. Since then, we've seen a rebound in labor force participation with the 25 to 54 year old uh, age group slightly above pre-pandemic levels. And although overall participation is below where it was before COVID, economists at the New York Fed have found that this shortfall is more than fully accounted for by the aging, or what I prefer to call the maturing of the workforce. Now, this increase in labor force participation has helped alleviate some of the imbalances we've seen in the labor market, but with baby boom, boomers increasingly reaching retirement age, retirement age, population aging will continue to put downward pressure on participation in the medium term. Increases in the labor force from immigration, which has picked up from the pandemic lows, can partially offset this, but it's unlikely to fully undo the impact. So achieving, turning to inflation, achieving balance on the inflation side of our mandate has been more challenging. Last June, inflation spiked to a 40-year high of 7%, as measured by the Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index. Since then, inflation has moderated to 4.2%, in large part due to a decline in energy prices. Now, that's much better than 7%, but still more than double the FOMC's longer run goal of 2% inflation. This inflation target is an important bedrock principle uh, for the FOMC. It provides a North Star for our policy decisions and helps improve the public's understanding of our goals and our actions. 
It's also helped to keep various measures of longer-run inflation expectations remarkably well anchored at levels consistent with our 2% longer-run goal. Although short- and medium-term inflation expectations rose during the pandemic, these measures have, have since come down. Indeed, based on the latest reading from the New York Fed's survey of consumer expectations, three-year-ahead expectations have returned to a level nearly identical to the average between 2014 and 2020. And although one-year-ahead inflation expectations in the survey remain elevated, they've declined considerably from the peak level reached back in June of 2022. So to understand why inflation remains so high, it's instructive to examine inflation developments in various sectors of the economy. So far, inflation has declined in many categories of commodities and goods, which tend to be more sensitive to higher interest rates. In addition, supply chains, which were severely constrained after the pandemic's onset, have co improved considerably. This is something I hear from business leaders from around the district, but also the New York Fed's Global Supply Chain Pressure Index has declined to a level uh, that indicates supply chain pressures are now actually somewhat lower than normal, lower than the pre-pandemic levels. At the same time, the March price data indicates some moderation in overall rent inflation. And rents for new leases have been showing slower rates of increases, which should help bring inflation, uh, shelter inflation down in coming months. Now, this is really important because shelter inflation has been a significant driver of the high inflation that we've seen over the past year. But the most persistent area of inflation is what is referred to as core services excluding housing. And that's been running about 4.5% since last August. Now, this is driven by a continued imbalance between overall supply and demand, it's going to take the longest to bring down. Now, in the rise of Skywalker, Anakin urged Ray to bring back the balance. And that's what the FOMC has been doing and taking strong actions to do accomplish that. Last week, the FOMC raised the target range for the federal funds rate to five to five and a quarter percent. That's our 10th consecutive rate increase. In our post-meeting uh, statement, the FOMC indicated that in determining the extent to which additional policy firming may be appropriate to re return inflation to 2% over time, you cannot actually read this whole sentence without taking a breath somewhere. So I'll take a... The committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. In addition, the FOMC indicated it will continue to reduce its holdings of treasury securities and agency debt and agency mortgage-backed securities, according to the framework that was announced a year ago. The FOMC also said that the committee will closely monitor incoming information and assess the implications for monetary policy. I will be particularly focused on assessing the evolution of credit conditions and their effects on the outlook for growth, employment, and inflation. Now, because of the lag of between monetary policy actions and their effects, it will take time for the FOMC's actions to restore balance to the economy and to return inflation back to our 2% target. In terms of my forecast, I expect inflation to decline uh, to around three and a quarter percent this year before returning to our longer run goal of 2% over the next two years. As tighter monetary policy continues to take effect, I expect real GDP to grow only modestly this year with growth in picking up somewhat next year. And I, and I anticipate the slow growth will continue to cool the labor market with unemployment gradually rising to about four to four and a half percent over the next year. Now, I'm confident that we're on the path to restoring price stability. And as always, I'll be monitoring the totality of the data and what it implies for the achievement of our goals. And to paraphrase the wise philosopher Yoda, a little more knowledge lights our way. Thank you.